given, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in a business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, this is going to be an interesting topic. It's going to relate to supervisors trying to make sure that their front line maintains that level of authority. We want to talk about accessibility versus availability. And I want to make sure that when we have this dialogue, you understand what those terms mean to us in the relationship to the dialogue we're having. So I want people to know that when I'm talking about supervisors and then using the terms accessibility and availability, we're talking about supervisors and their relationship to the inmates, not the supervisors and their relationship to the front line, because at all times, I would like to think that the supervisors should be accessible and available to the frontline officers, the frontline staff. I'm talking about the supervisors and their relationship uh, with the inmate population. It's going to be a good conversation. Again, accessibility versus availability. And of course, we have Connie Eileen, author Connie Eileen. Author, what's going on? <laughs> Connie Eileen, how you doing? Hi, everybody. Connie Eileen here. I'm the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy. And I am now the author of The Fly Behind the Wall that is doing really great. So I thank everybody for their support, all who purchased and all those who are interested in, please make sure you go to www.thecagewashercocoon.com and get your copy. I will autograph every single copy that goes through that site. Yeah, guys, we had a great book signing. I thought you were, that was just, I mean, I said we had a great, you had a great, we had a great book, book signing. signing. <laughs> My book signing is going to be at Chili's. Uh, so, <laughs> I won't even be, I'm going to have to be able to get a dessert or an appetizer. I don't have all these choices. Uh, but this is going to be a great dialogue. When we come back from our sponsor, uh, Connie's going to give us the foundation. So how we're going to define the terms accessible and available uh, in regards, again, to the inmate population and the supervisor. And then we'll have our dialogue um, from there. So we come back from our sponsors. Very interesting dialogue. Now, guys, if you happen to show Tear Talks for your brave men and women at work in corrections, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell is going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor. Let's talk about accessibility versus availability. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. All right, and we're back. So, Connie, so help me out. And now, remember, as we were having this discussion, I, I, again, just to make it clear, it's the relationship between the supervisor and the inmate. If you are frontline, and you hear this dialogue, I'm not talking about the supervisor and front line. I think at all times, supervisors should be available and accessible to the front line. I'm talking about supervisors and inmates. Okay, okay, Connie. <laughs> all right, so with availability, that means that you know, you're available to be used. You're at someone's disposal. And so when the inmates are looking for availability, they're looking to have access to whomever 
right? Almost making sure that that person is someone who is at their disposal, where that should not be the case. Um, in the instance of accessibility, that means that someone can be reached, right? So if you need someone, you can reach them. You need them, they're approachable, they're easy to talk to, and so they are accessible if needed, not necessarily available or at someone's disposal, as that's sort of the distinction between the availability and the accessibility. Yeah, like if you're available, you're a resource. You know what I mean? I, I like to think like I'm available for you today. That means I'm a resource for you. Accessible as you're right is, am I available technically? You know what I mean? You know, now I want to tell some, this is something that we had a discussion with a while back and it's kind of just to reiterate it is that when you're a supervisor, yes, you could be made available, but you shouldn't that be that easily accessible. If that makes sense. Um, you know, what, what supervisors have to realize is that, if they make themselves constantly accessible to the inmate population for any little concern that the inmates have to deal with, you know, and sometimes these concerns are just ways for inmates to circumvent frontline authority and then go ahead and get that supervisor involved to kind of question the power of that frontline professional. When the supervisor makes themselves too accessible, they don't realize this, but you're actually limiting the power of the front line to do their job. I mean, would you agree with that, Connie? So that's absolutely right. So the way I look at it as is, so as supervisors, we are responsible for reinforcing the chain of command. And in doing so, your availability or your accessibility rather should be when it's appropriate. Right. So if there's something going on and, you know, some reason the inmate needs the next level in the chain of command, that's fine. But that would be after they've already exhausted their frontline person. And then that frontline person has escalated to escalated it up the chain of command. It should not be that the next level is accessible to the inmate population that we create the path to circumvent the frontline worker. Right. And again, uh, I remember when someone said, was, yeah, I'm a, I remember them telling an inmate, a good supervisor, said, you know, I'm available when needed. So that's like, yeah, I'm available when needed. But guess who makes the, 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 the determination if that supervisor is needed? The yeah. front line and the, and the supervisor working together. Now, one of the things I remember was, and we maybe kind of had this dialogue, because I'm kind of touching on the dialogue that I also had a couple of days ago, is because... I remember feeling powerless as an officer when I had a supervisor that would just always come in and cater to the inmates, right? And it got to the point where I become frustrated, I become disenfranchised, but you know, I'm still new, so I'm kind of taking the hits, right? And then one day, the sergeant starts to realize that, you know, again, it looks like you have no power over this unit. And of course, me now being upset, what I said in return was, well, maybe me not having power in this unit is related to the reasons why the inmates love you so much. And I don't know where that came from, but I, I promise you, shit went quiet. And I'm like, uh oh, you know, what? <laughs> but it had to be said, you know, it had to be said. Every time he would come into the unit, the inmates would flock him. They would just go to him and it would be about the concerns that they had with me running, you know, which were legit. Yeah, I'm telling you no, because these are the right things to say no to. And, you know, it, it's how I run my unit. Now- but he allowed he, it. Huh? He allowed it. Yes, yeah, yeah. So what happens is the moment he would come to the unit, the, the moment he circumvented, let's do it this way. The moment the first inmate went around me and went to him, and then he circumvented my authority by literally not even talking to me, but listening to what the inmate had to say and then making the change without even getting my perspective. Or if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, then letting me make the change. So I hold on to that perception of authority. He went ahead and did that. So now, not just in this inmate, but other inmates now see this person as available and accessible. Wow, he's a resource for the inmates now. Because every time I don't like what Ganji tells me to do, 
I know for a fact that I can go to this supervisor who is then going to help fix that. So right off the bat, the reason why this dialogue came into play is because I know supervisors should be made available if needed. They are a resource. Don't get me wrong. But seeing this person come into my unit every day, going around my level of authority with the inmates, I'm like, man, this supervisor is too accessible. I mean, would you agree? I mean, I mean, what would, I mean, if that was, if you were in my shoes at that point and you saw that happening and then your supervisor went ahead and told you that you have no control of your area, how would you respond? <laughs> I mean, I would be pissed to say the least, right? But I would also say, you know, so I know that within custody, there's a certain level of respect of the chain of command. So you may not, openly want to say this, but there's got to be a way that even if the supervisor isn't aware of the way that he's undermining the authority of the officer in the unit, the officer, I feel, has to be able to go to that supervisor and say, hey, can we talk to the inmates together, right? Like, because then I feel like it, it shows that there is some unity because you don't want that anything, who knows what the inmate is saying, right? So the fact that this supervisor is making himself or herself available. I mean, when you think about the availability, right? They say availability is able to be used, right? <laughs> or obtained at someone's disposal. So I don't think any of us wanna be at the disposal of the inmates. So our availability should always be pretty tight, right? Like it's, it is, we are available if you need us for something, right? So, and I think that's at any level. And I think when it comes to the, the supervisor, there's got to be a way that the supervisor can be redirected in a professional manner, because maybe he or she doesn't know the impact of what they're doing. Because I, I mean, I would like to say that sometimes people just malicious, some people love the power, Right. They love that feeling of coming in and I'm the man or I'm the woman and I can make things happen. Right. And they build their reputation off of that, not realizing the impact that it's having on the unit once they're gone. And so maybe it's a matter of having that conversation so that they're aware that there is a significant impact once you leave this unit. And now I no longer know what's going on because they're waiting for you to come. Right. And that's and I think that's also a dangerous space for that supervisor to be in, because why are you so involved? I, well, you know, you, you know, you're hitting it right on the, on the spot because if I was a supervisor and these inmates were coming up to me with these low level concerns, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to be bothered with that. That's for my officer. I trust that they're doing their job. And if they, again, if the concerns have to be corrected, we can figure out a way to do it where the officer still maintains that level of authority. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, what did your officer tell you? Yes, then that's between you and the officer. This is his ship or her ship. I'm here to deal with the emerging situations that are coming by and whatever this little concern is, is not really emerging to me. If the officer said no, I'm going to stand by that no. Now, having said that again, if there was a concern with the no, I'm not going to let the inmate know I have a concern with the no. You know, I'm going to do whatever I can to redirect that inmate back to that officer. But I will tell you one thing. I definitely will never make a decision without talking to that officer first. I Absolutely. mean, there are some times here where the, the supervisors become so accessible that they don't even bother going to the frontline person to see what that concern is. And I want to ask you this. Wouldn't you think that, let's say, when it comes to the availability and accessibility, that should always be filtered through the front line? Absolutely. That is the first line of defense, right? Like, you got to think of it as your front line is the filtering system, right? They're gonna take care of all the things that are within their scope. And the moment you start stepping into their realm, you start undermining their authority that's at their level. You take away the ability to escalate, right? So now they're troubleshooting, they're doing their best to handle things on their level. And now we need to take it to the next step, but you're already involved, right? Which now the next level is above you. So now we're going, three steps up for, I don't know, say toilet tissue, right? Like that's stupid. Why should we have to do that? Because you didn't allow that frontline person to do what they needed to do. I mean, the critical thinking is possible on all levels. And I think that we don't give 
the front line, the ability to have some autonomy to run the ship the way they need to run it. Sometimes, and then I think the, the hardest part about that or the challenging part is that on top of it all, we end up not giving them the direction that they need in order to be better, to do it better, to make the decision in the future because we've stepped in and we've handled it when we shouldn't have. Well, you know, you said it uh, 100%. Guys, if you're supervisors out there, mind you that sometimes your over accessibility will strongly relate to the authority that the front line has. I guess they're partnered in a way. So yeah. if you're too accessible, the officer or the front line loses that level of authority. But if you're least accessible and only available when really needed, then the officers or the front line maintain that level of authority. So, so I think what we're getting at here is that, that the supervisor's accessibility really does relate to the perception of authority uh, that the officer has, again, in relationship to the supervisor and the inmate, correct? Yes. Do you see yes. that as, as strongly related? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a level of empowerment that the officers have to have to begin with, right? So here's this authority, and, and, and I feel like the supervisors have to allow the front line to do their jobs and give them the ability to escalate when they need to. Give them the ability to figure it out. Like, there's no need for you to step in unless you've been invited to this situation. Now, of course, if it's something with some significant liability or something like that, and you know, maybe the supervisor can see 10 steps ahead, then by all means, you know, supervisors got to do what they have to do. But I mean, simple things as far as accessibility and availability to the inmates, that should not be dictated by an inmate. That should be dictated by the front line. Okay, this is something I can't seem to figure out. I can't handle it. Let me take it to the next level whatever that next level in the chain of command is, but that decision should be that frontline worker's decision and not the inmate's decision. Right, and I think the gist of the dialogue is really related to the supervisors, knowing that we have the officers that need empowerment on that front line. You know, they do. They, because again, you're going to leave the unit. They still got to effectively run it. You know, so at the end of the day is you have to make sure that those inmates know where they need to go when they mm -hmm. have a concern and who has the authority to handle it. But they also need to know as a supervisor what you're willing to do and what you're willing not to do. You know, mm -hmm. and again, the greater level concerns, yes, not an issue. Of course, I'll take care of that. But there are certain house concerns that if you're able to walk into a unit and the inmates don't even go to the officer to even ask if they could talk to you, they just kind of flood, flood on you right away. You're doing this wrong. And I want you guys to realize when that happens, Take a step back and look at the officers in that unit. Watch how they're reacting to what's happening the moment you allow one or two or three inmates to bypass them and get to you. you I, like, I like what Connie says. There's a level of command, just like there is for officers or, or any frontline position, technically. You have that level of command. You know, So to see an inmate disregard the officer and go right to you is insulting enough. But then to see you allowing that to happen or committing to behaviors that motivate the inmates to do that, to me, that's the biggest insult of it all. Because if an inmate goes around me, I, I could expect that, not a problem. But what I expect from my supervisor is to turn that inmate back around. You know, for whatever, you know, give, give me back my perception of authority. So again, guys, and again, we're just keeping the dialogue quick here. That accessibility, you need to realize that if you are extremely accessible as a supervisor to the inmate population, look how that can disenfranchise staff from doing their job because the inmates will manipulate you to circumvent that front line's level of authority. And again, just to, I, I got to reiterate this, but the biggest hypocritical statement I ever got was literally, Ganji, it looks like you have no control of your unit. And then I have to go back and say, well, maybe that relates to why the inmates love you so much. I mean, that, that to me just pieces that all together. Hey, Connie, any, any thoughts you want to say in closing? I mean, I just want to say that as supervisors, we have to be very mindful, mindful of the messages that we send, as well as the behaviors that re we reinforce 
And so if inmates are allowed to circumvent the officer in the housing unit and come directly to you as a supervisor, just understand that you are reinforcing that behavior. And the inmate now knows have respect for the chain of command because you've taught him or her that it's okay to circumvent the chain of command. When you don't redirect, you are giving positive reinforcement to negative behavior. And we've got to take control back from the inmate population and make sure that they understand that the, that the front line, they're the ones in charge. And when they find it necessary to escalate, they escalate. They are not allowed. And we have to do better with not allowing them or empowering them to disrespect the chain of command. Yeah, guys, this is just a dialogue, just to kind of put it out there, because no one's perfect. Like Connie said, sometimes we don't know you know, that maybe we're causing a conflict. So if anything, just take it as knowledge. I mean, I love when Connie said positive reinforcement to negative behavior. We're all guilty of that. I'll call Connie at three in the morning. Let's do a show. And <laughs> I should be calling her at that time. But she says, yes. So what does that do? Next day, 3 a.m. Connie, you want to do a show? This motherfucker. But she does it. So what does that do? The next day, 3 a.m. Stop it. <laughs> but, but but it's true though so, but I like what you said that was very powerful to me is that you're motivating the behavior and sometimes what you don't realize is just take a just take a breather and look at the front line see how they react when because I, I will guarantee you this and, and, and before I before I say something uh, to close is the inmate that goes to that supervisor that officer knows why that inmate's going to that supervisor the officer or the staff member knows that that inmate's going there because they're trying to circumvent that level of authority. So that's already in the officer's mind. So the moment you embrace that inmate, what do you think that's saying to that frontline staff member? You know, and again, embrace, I don't mean to, I just mean to accept instead of redirecting the inmate, like Connie said. Uh, but as always, guys, don't forget, Connie's got the book out, Cage was a cocoon, great book, a great book, sign of phenomenal. Just the support you have was just a beautiful thing. Something great to be a part of. And, and it's great to see that, as I mentioned it in the interview that we did briefly, was that, you know, it, it, not about the, just the accomplishment of the book, but the people that saw the journey to all show up there to kind of be with you as you move forward. Uh, I just, it's very impressive. It, it really is. It, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, makes me want to go back to church for some reason. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm getting at. All right, so as always, guys, the show is here that we have it. Please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell will notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe.